Hi, Pi Ohio. My name is Dan Shelkoff, and I'm the Internal Services Group Lead at Tenet3, a company located in Dayton, Ohio. And today, I'm going to talk to you about the annotated type, which is a way of including typing metadata into Python. It was released in Python 3.9, but has gained a lot of popularity this year because of its inclusion into FastAPI and Pydantic. And when I first read the documentation on how to use the annotated type in those packages, it was really confusing to know how this annotated type works behind the scenes and provides the functionality <laughs> that they say it can give it. And so I hope that this talk can shed a little bit of light about what is happening and how it works. So it's a little easier to understand what's going on in those packages. So let's start by looking at how the annotated type works within the type system. If we look at our first example here, we have a variable called annotated int. I set the value to two, and I have this big, scary type hint right in the middle that uses the annotated type. The arguments inside the annotated type are broken into two different categories. The first one is just the very first argument. And this one is special is because this one is the one that the rest of the type system sees as the type for annotated int. If I hit play here, you can see that the type of annotated int is an integer. It isn't the annotated type. So anytime I use annotated int, it's considered an integer by the typing system. That leads us to the second group inside the annotated arguments, and that is arguments two through n. And those are metadata. They can be any type. This is a string, of course, but you could use a class for an example. And all of these are not visible by the typing system. You can see here, right, there's no evidence of metadata here unless you go and specifically look for the metadata. And we'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. But the cool thing is, since this is considered an integer by the typing system, I can pass this into a function that only requires an integer and does not have the annotated type in the function. There's no errors here. There's no linter errors for type mismatches. And so I can hit play. Everything works as intended. Everybody's happy. And I can do the opposite as well. I can take an integer that does not have the annotated type, right? Of course, this is of, class, of type int. And I can pass it into a function that does have a parameter that uses the annotated type. When I pass in this unannotated integer, right, of type int into this function, this function, the type, the type system is only looking for int. It's not looking for annotated again, right? So there's no typing mismatch. Everything works as intended. We're good to go. And what this does, being able to go both ways like that, gives us a lot of flexibility to only, to only have to use annotated where we need to. I don't need to change the rest of my code to make annotated work in specific sections of my code. I don't need a third party package to fix their code to support annotated because it doesn't play nice with my annotated code, right? Because it goes down into that first argument and uses that type for the rest of its lifetime, it is backwards compatible. I, it plays nicely with the type system, whether it's a third party package or your other code. So that's pretty cool and pretty useful. So we understand now how the typing system handles the annotated type, but now how do we get the metadata? There's a couple of different ways that we can do that. And that's through one of them is through the Dunder metadata attribute. This is a special attribute that only the annotated type has. As you can see, if we hit play, uh, the annotated type up here has that Dunder metadata method. And the normal integer type does not have that Dunder metadata method. What this returns is a tuple of the metadata. Again, this is arguments two through n of the annotated type hint. 
So the other way or another way that we can use to get the metadata is through the get type hints function. This is available through the typing module and it has to be used on a function, a method, a module, or a class. And what this returns is a dictionary where the keys are the parameter names like first num and second num here in this case. And then the values are the type. So if we hit play here, we see that both of them are integers, even though that this one is using an annotated type up here. So there's a caveat to using git type hints if you want the annotated version. You have to include the include extras parameter and set that to true. And this is by default false to maintain backwards compatibility. And so if I hit play here, I get type hints and I can use the dunder metadata attribute like I would with, uh, like I showed you above. Now that we've gone through all of that and learned how the annotated type works, what's it used for? What's the purpose? What's the point? Well, I want to show you a basic validator that is going to work similarly to how Pydantic runs its validation logic when you put it into an annotated type. So we're going to show a a bare bones example of what what it what it looks like and how it works so you can better understand what's happening with Pydantic. So the first thing that we're going to do is create this concept of a validator. And it only has one method and it is essentially just taking in a value and then testing it against a constraint. And if it passes that constraint, we're going to return true. If it doesn't, then we're going to return some sort of error to make sure that the user is aware that it did not pass validation. And so in this case, we're just testing positive integers. Uh, if it's a positive integer, then it's good. If it's not, we're going to throw the error. And now we have our actual data class. And we're going to just take a simple square with one side. Of course, since it's the length, we want a positive value. And so how we're going to ensure that side is a positive value is we're going to put it into this annotated type. Again, this is the first argument. So side is considered an integer everywhere else. And then we have this metadata here. We have an instance of positive integer validator and just a silly string that is there for an example. If we look at the post init, for this class, right? This is what this is what gets called after all of these uh, instance variables are assigned and created. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get the type hints again. the The type uh, that we get on the return is dict is a dictionary of parameter names and the the actual type. If we want the annotation data, which we do, we want to say include extras. Okay. And then we're going to go through each parameter and look at the typing information for each parameter. If it has the Dunder metadata attribute, right, that means it's an annotated type. And then we can grab that tuple back out. So now we have a tuple of all the metadata for that individual parameter. In this case, we only have one parameter. And but we have two pieces of metadata. So we need to go and run through each piece of metadata. And we only care about running validation on those that are an instance of validator. And again, that is our base class up here. So that's why we created this base class is so we could easily run this is instance a function on our metadata to check to see if it's a validator type. Since it's a validator type, we know it has a validator method, and we can use that to validate the side uh, in relation to the this constraint. Okay, I could have multiple constraints, right? I could create multiple validators up here and add them up here, but then, uh, right, it runs through there. If it passes validation, then uh, basically the object, the square object, is good to go. If it 
doesn't pass validation, then we get that value error up here. So if we hit play, we get that value error. If we hit play here, everything works good. And I know this is a silly example, and it would be much easier just to write that logic in here. Uh, but uh, this gives you an idea of how uh, Pydantic works, and I'll show you uh, how it works here in just a second. First, we're going to look at how Pydantic instantiates the model or the data class. Uh, it, it's equivalent to a data class. And so uh, here we're just going to create a silly shape that we're going to call an even rectangle. And this even rectangle has to have a length and a height that are both even. And we're going to say that they both have to be positive and they're both integers. Okay, so it's a very simple class. Uh, but here we have two constraints, right? We want to make sure that the length is positive and that, uh, or that both values are positive and that both values are even. So we have two pieces of validation to accomplish. So with Pydantic, we can do that through the annotated type. Um, we have an integer, right? And so that's what height is seen through the rest of the typing system is an integer. And then we have two pieces of metadata to help with that validation. One is this field object that ensures that the integer is greater than zero, GT, uh, for greater than. And then we have this after validator that looks to make sure uh, that it's even because we pass in this function that runs on the value to make sure everything works right. And if it doesn't, we throw a value error. If it does, then we return it. This works very similarly to our basic example up above, right? Uh, Pydantic is doing very similar things here, right? It's getting the type hints. It's looking through the metadata. It's finding the metadata <coughs> that, uh, that is an instance of after validator, right? And if it is an instance of after validator, then it's running that class and running a specific method inside that class to make sure that it's even. Um, and so um, that that's how it's using this annotated type uh, to provide that metadata and provide that validation. This is also equivalent to this. Uh, we just have uh, a, a nested annotated type. So we just have a positive int type alias here with the the field right greater than zero and then we're putting this into here right and we're adding we're basically adding an additional piece of metadata here right to ensure that it's positive and even integer and so we can use that here uh, you can see that it works the validation is working as expected right length is a negative two it should be greater than zero height is five it needs to be even if both parameters meet the expectations, then everything works out OK. Uh, we're putting the validation info up in a type alias and not inside of the class. You might find it beneficial because then you can reuse those types in different objects without necessarily having to resort to things like inheritance. Here we have, we want to create a pyramid and we want all the lengths to be positive, just like we did with the rectangle. But uh, if we have, if we're, if we put everything in this type alias, right, we can reuse this type alias and get the same validation. And so this is one way. Um, it may not be as readable as other ways that you can create models in Pydantic, but it is a, a nice way to reuse some validation logic between different models if you need to. So it could be a, a really nice way to uh, architect your uh, Pydantic models to, to eliminate some code rewrite. Uh, it might not be applicable in all situations, but uh, it's something to keep, keep, uh, keep in mind. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. If 
you uh, want to see this or want to reference this somewhere else, it is available in my GitHub account up here. Have a good day.